infectious diseases, research, medicine, health. Welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. And now, broadcasting from the Outbreak News Skylar Studios in beautiful West Central Florida, here is your host, microbiologist and editor of OutbreakNewsToday.com, Robert Harriman. Well, hey, everybody, this is Robert, and welcome to Outbreak News Interviews. Now, in today's podcast, I want to look at some important areas concerning coronavirus disease 2019 or COVID-19. And I was really fortunate to get today's expert guest, despite his incredibly busy schedule. So joining me today to look at several issues about COVID-19 is friend of the show, Michael Osterholm, Ph.D., Dr. Osterholm is the director of the Center for Infectious Disease Research and Policy, better known as SIDRAP, at the University of Minnesota. Dr. Osterholm, welcome back to the show, sir. Thank you, Robert. It's good to be with you again. Well, I want to take a look at some of the bigger, more pressing issues concerning the current COVID-19 pandemic. And all signs and reports are pointing to testing. And the politicians, the media, and many people in public health are really pushing for mass testing. So I have two questions about that. Is there real value in mass PCR testing? And is it even logistically possible? Well, this has been one of the challenges of trying to match up reality with what uh, people think should be done or can be done. Unfortunately, in many instances, we don't have the right people with experience in either clinical lab testing or in the area of public health uh, driving the the truck here. Uh, so first of all, just uh, there are really three issues around testing uh, with PCR that need to be uh, front and center. One is we just have a major shortage of PCR testing that will improve. But let's not forget that when Wuhan first happened in December, the world had a supply chain for test reagents and swabs that was basically matched with the needs at that time. Uh, with Wuhan uh, taking off like it did, there surely was an increased need for these reagents uh, and uh, the swabs and so forth. And uh, that only continued to expand as we saw this uh, situation in Asia in particular expand. Well, then once Wu, uh, the Wuhan experience continued to grow and then the world started to catch up and it caught on fire with uh, COVID-19 disease, the entire world wanted to test uh, by PCR and using the reagents that, again, this limited uh, manufacturing capacity was supplying. And so we, why should we have been surprised that we are having major challenges with shortages? Six weeks ago, I wrote an op-ed piece in the New York Times saying that in about four to five weeks, we would see basically a major uh, lo a loss of capacity because of the reagent issue, and so it wasn't a surprise. No one's really addressed that head-on yet. Instead, we just keep getting people talking about testing millions and millions of people every week without understanding the reality of this. And to paraphrase um, one of the former defense secretaries who said, you know, you don't get to go to war with the army you want. You have to go with what you have. And this is exactly what the situation is here. So it will improve over time. But that's still a challenge. We won't have all the tests we want. Number two, what really is concerning is both in terms of PCR testing for virus as well as for uh, serology for antibody, uh, after the CDC had its challenges uh, with getting testing kits out and uh, allowing the U.S. to begin testing, uh, there was a cry for more testing that was very legitimate. But what the FDA did to respond to that was almost a political reaction, not a scientific reaction. And what it did is under the emergency use authorization uh, rubric basically opened up uh, so for to a certain degree PCR testing, which is being reviewed, but under this authorization uh, has a wide breadth of what it can do and can't do, as well as in serology, basically it just said, you know, register, that's it. You put your shingle up if you say that you can do this. And so right now, unfortunately, um, more so on the serology side, but a lot of the testing we have, on the market is junk. It's nothing more than junk. And people don't understand the limitations of this testing. We've had examples of uh, Chinese uh, manufactured PCR tests that are running 40% false negatives, meaning that in fact that they're not, they're positives, but they're really <laughs> showing up as negatives. And so that this has been a big challenge. In serology, uh, the problems are equally uh, uh, acute, if not more acute, because there, the bait is not a molecular diagnostic test. It's actually, as we know, make it develop 
for antibody detection, there that is very much influenced by the prevalence of the condition in the population. And when you're dealing with 5% of the population infected in hot spots, it may be as high as 12 to 14%, but across the board, it's, it's about that 5% level. The prevalence uh, has a huge influence on how many false positives you get. So if I'm testing for antibody today, for every positive I get that's truly antibody positive, I'll get at least one false positive. So I tell a doctor or nurse, you're antibody positive, but you have a one in two chance it's not real. And then we don't really know for sure what it means. So we, we have to understand the performance of these tests as it relates also to the the community and what we can tell people they mean. So people talking about these immune passports and so forth are far, far premature. People are trying to open up the country based on testing, absolutely not understanding what the potential impact will be using testing for making those decisions. And so, uh, you know, we need to have a dialogue. I, today in the New York Times, I have an op-ed piece in that actually addresses this very issue uh, in some detail and covers the points that I just shared with you. Okay, well, let's go ahead and um, I, I got a couple questions concerning the antibody test. And uh, at this point, are there okay. any quality antibody tests available? Uh, right now, it's hard to know what's really available with antibody testing in terms of sensitivity and specificity and how they're performed just because of the fact that uh, these are largely unregulated by the FDA. You just have to file and say that you can do this type of test and these are the uh, characteristics of the test as they're in your hands. But these can be done in very, very few samples. Uh, and uh, surely we've already seen real challenges with some of these uh, uh, testing programs. The second thing is, is that how you test uh, is also very important, meaning who you're testing as individuals. We've had several uh, notable studies that have been released recently about testing, but in each instance, how people recruited to those studies make a big difference in how you can interpret the results. So even if you're trying to do it for a population basis, not just an individual, the study in Santa Clara County, when you look at the recruitment process where people were basically told things uh, about, you know, you could get tested here and would know if you'd been previously infected, uh, issues around if you need to travel, this can be a piece of information that can help you with the travel, uh, the type of recruitment uh, where people were urged to uh, come and it's not a randomly selected uh, population based on how they did recruitment. So, uh, you know, that's a real challenge to understand what those data really mean. The same thing is true in a village in Germany. Uh, the same thing is even true with the New York City data or the state of New York where, uh, again, the test done by the Wadsworth Laboratory is probably one of the best in the country. And I think overall the recruitment, you know, surely is for what it is, but they were recruiting people who went to the grocery store right during the period when New York City and the state of New York was in a lockdown. Well, who is it that's most likely to be positive if, in fact, you're going to test people to look for, for previous infection? It's going to be people who are out and about during the lockdown. Uh, it's really not going to be the people who are sheltering in place and who haven't left. So to take those numbers and extrapolate them to the whole state of New York is just really not appropriate. And that's what happened in that one. So so the test is by itself the methods a challenge, but then also how it's applied in the interpretation are equally a challenge. I come away with the following conclusion. Antibody testing will have little impact at all on whether we reopen or how we reopen or what we do. Uh, it will also be of very limited value right now in terms of making any other uh, what I would call political decisions about where to go with next steps. What it will do, however, is provide us with the sense that, yes, only 5 to 15 percent of the U.S. population is currently infected. And uh, we know that this virus, which is highly infectious, will not stop until it basically hits a herd immunity level mm -hmm. of of the population, meaning that one of two things have to happen. Either 60 to 70 percent of the population gets infected, develops immunity as a result of that infection, or dies, uh, and then hopefully we have some short and even long-term immunity with that. Or we have a vaccine, and a vaccine surely is not coming in the next 16 to 18 months. And so really between now and then, this virus is going to keep trying to get to that proportion of the population before herd immunity kicks in and uh, begins to slow down transmission. We're a long ways from 5 to 15% of the population currently infected to 60 to 70%. And so what we've been really experiencing already with these, these peaks and these valleys we talk about, I just remind people, you know, we've only been in the foothills, not the mountains yet. 
and uh, we have mountains yet to climb with this uh, virus. Well, despite what you just said, um, a lot of people want to make big decisions based on the antibody test. And um, since we truly don't know whether infection confers short or long-term immunity with this particular virus, what does a positive IgG mean concerning actual immunity? You know, we don't know for certain. I have a sense it does imply at least short-term and maybe intermediate long-term immunity. We have some animal challenge data using uh, macaque monkeys that surely support that uh, they were protected against reinfection when we challenged some a period after they had originally been infected. Um, we also see some data right now with vaccines, at least two different studies in China and one in the United States have demonstrated that the early vaccine work using animal models uh, on rechallenge or challenge for the first time, I should say, after having been vaccinated, that they're protected. So I do think that, that the possibility for immunity is there, but having understood the challenges with SARS and MERS and some of the work that the coronavirus sector has been doing for, you know, the last 20 years, um, there's, there surely still are questions about just how durable immunity might be, how, how well it might work, uh, and we have to answer those. I think the second thing that we have before us is the challenge on safety. Uh, you know, there's a concern, and it's been expressed by a number of people, that this antibody-dependent enhancement, ADE, or the condition of where antibody uh, is, in, is at, uh, induced at a certain level but not sufficient enough to protect you against sexual reinfection that can actually then cause this immunologic cascade to occur. And exactly what we saw happening with the dengue vaccine several years ago in the Philippines and places like that where it was eventually withdrawn because kids were... In, the, in fact, uh, suffering severe disease, having been previously vaccinated and then getting infected. So uh, we've got some questions and challenges yet, but I mean, we're all very hopeful the vaccine will be there. I realize hope is not a strategy, but in fact, it's, uh, it's what we're counting on right now. And, and our job is to try to keep infections as low as possible until that time where we can be rescued by the vaccine and not uh, hit over the head by the virus. Um, and so that's what's going to be really our, our needed goal to, to look at. Yeah. Uh, let's go ahead and switch gears to the death toll in the U.S. or globally. Uh, about 60,000 deaths reported here, about 200,000 worldwide. Dr. Osterholm, how are they getting these numbers? Um, how can you determine if COVID-19 was the actual cause of death without an autopsy? Well, first of all, I think it's really clear that, uh, you know, something walks like a duck quacks like a duck and looks like a duck is probably a duck. And I don't mean to make a light of uh, the very serious question you just asked, but when you look at the mortality data, that it does not matter which country you're talking about where you've had hotspots with this virus, it is unlike anything we've seen in, in modern history. I mean, just think of the fact that in early March, this virus was not even, or the death due to this virus was not even the top 75 causes of death, and just over the past few weeks has been the number one cause of death in this country by day. Um, that's remarkable. So there, right now, that's just knowing that people have died. Uh, as you've been seeing in other reports uh, from some of the uh, newspapers that have been supporting studies looking at actual mortality, mortality is far, far higher right now in cities like New York, elsewhere, beyond that that even can even come closely to being described as having been diagnosed with coronavirus 19, you know, the COVID-19 infection. So uh, I think that two things are happening. One, we're still missing deaths in a big way that are associated with this infection. I grant you comorbidities play a role, and the question has been age-old uh, for other diseases like influenza. When is the death due to the virus? When is the death due to the underlying condition? That's a very fair and important uh, assessment. But somebody who has uh, an underlying heart condition but then ends up dying from a pneumonia or an ARDS-type picture, acute respiratory assessment in picture, that's not because of their heart problem. Um, that's actually due to the virus. So I think we can, as we have historically with influenza, uh, partition out which deaths are due to which. I think the bigger challenge is knowing when a death occurred that is, in a sense, COVID-19 related, but not due to the virus, but rather due to the inability to access health care or a fear of going into health care. How many people in uh, some of the hot spots have died from heart attacks uh, where they had early signs and symptoms? They could have and should have gone into the emergency room. Something may have been done to salvage them, 
but instead they waited because their fear of going to the hospital that they would contract uh, this infection while there. And so we still have a lot of work to do to really understand this, but there is no doubt anybody who has been in an intensive care unit anywhere in the world in the last three to five months will tell you uh, what this virus can do is simply, simply stunningly horrible. Okay. Well, uh, retrospectively, this is an opinion question. Um, when we finally determine exposure for all these asymptomatic and mildly symptomatic patients, do you think that we'll see the overall death rate plummet to maybe flu-like levels? Well, first of all, this is not flu. People have to understand that. I mean, when's the last time, dating back to 1918, you've seen what this has done to emergency rooms and intensive care units? I mean, you know, you don't, you don't have to even look at numbers. You can look at what it's done. And that by itself says this is not flu. And, you know, I think this, this debate about the case fatality rate misses a huge point. One, we're just getting started. If this is bad relative to a flu year, remember, we're only at 5 to 15% of the population has yet experienced this. And it's just unfolding. The difference between the flu season of several months is here we may have the next 20 months of highly active, very damaging, catastrophic potential uh, virus activity. So I think that that's what people are missing right now, that when this is all said and done, this will be written up much like 1918. Uh, you know, we, we studied this as a, as a modern-day population, 1918. It seems like so remote, so far back. Our great-grandkids will be studying about the coronavirus uh, pandemic of 2020, 21, 22. And I think that that's the message that people need to understand that uh, this debate about case fatality rate, I think, first of all, is, is horrible. And second of all, let me just say, I think in a lot of the populations um, where we have data supporting that, uh, you know, there's a lot of mild or asymptomatic infections. If it's done in serology, I just don't believe it because I think that we have so many challenges with that. Even if you do it in PCR, the dynamic means of transmission and what happens in an outbreak setting really means you have to follow this for some time to understand what, what is happening. Case in point, look at the Diamond Princes. When they did their first sampling of the Diamond Princes, 50% of the people were asymptomatically infected with this virus. Everybody said, wow, that's a big chunk. They followed the people for 10 days more, that number dropped to 13%. Meaning that in the time period from the sample until the next 10 days, that many more people became ill with the virus. And so one of the challenges we've had is understanding that a sample is a sample is a sample, but follow it over time to understand what is the proportion of individuals who then become symptomatic. I don't see this huge, huge bolus of people out there who are, are asymptomatic and, and not being picked up. I think that there are surely asymptomatic individuals, but it's not, you know, 40 to 50 times the number that some people purported. Second of all, when we talk about asymptomatic, we have to remember we're talking about really two things. Asymptomatic, meaning you never have a symptom, or pre-symptomatic, which today we realize can be a very major time for transmission of the virus. And there we're talking about potentially days, three, four days, of where someone may be highly infectious, not at all clinically ill, but then does become clinically ill. And that's, I think, the real challenge we have. Mm. Interesting. Um, and let me go ahead and close with this question, um, and I'm sure you have a okay. great, great answer for this. <laughs> how would you grade how the U.S. is dealing with this on all levels, federal, state, local, even private? Uh, what's been good and what needs improvement? Yeah. Well, there are many issues that we are aware of that um, we surely can do much better with in this country. Um, I would say right now, uh, I think the governors have, on a whole, performed very well, trying to each be a public health czar, a, a, a guiding light in our states, and at the same time dealing with the financial ruins that this is wrecking in terms of, of governments and local and, and communities. I think uh, I regret that the CDC has not been more involved in a front and center way that uh, I think that they bring a, a tremendous amount of expertise to this issue and we surely need to see them more. So at this point, I would just say that, um, you know, we're only in the second inning of this game. I've seen teams that have been down 8-0 to zero, uh, in the second inning come back and win the game. 
And my hope is is that with uh, every day we just get better at it, and one day someone's going to say, you know, the U.S. did pretty well with that on a whole. So that that's my hope. Okay. Well, I'm very diplomatic, sir. <laughs> okay. Um, I want <laughs> to thank Robert. you. I want to thank you, Dr. Michael Osterholm, for sharing your time and your expertise once again with me. I appreciate it. Thanks a lot. Have a good day.